How feels everybody? Awake and ready. I'll try my best to do the same. <laughs> Hi, my name is Riemann. I'm from uh, the Emerald City of Seattle and have a few things about meditation perhaps to share with, with all of us here today. You know, life is unfair. We know that. For years coming down here from the Northwest, from the Portland community, the Seattle community where I live, people would, uh, if it ever rained down here, when we were here, they'd look at us, our friends here who live here, and they say, well, did you bring the rain? And okay, I just sort of put up with this every year. <laughs> well, this time, because we had a heat wave recently, the first thing someone, one of my friends said to me when I landed the other day, did you bring the heat? As uh, speaking of the Wizard of Oz and uh, the Emerald City, when Dorothy killed that witch with her house, I think one of the first things she said was, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. And I'd like to talk about that, not Kansas, not the Emerald City, but of course the goal of meditation. Padma and I were camping recently. It had been a few years since we had the opportunity. We were quite eager and packed up and we're heading up to the mountains of the Cascades there in Washington. Very beautiful. And I was very confident I'd been to one of these favorite campsites before several times. Didn't bother to consult the map. Just barreled up the mountainside and in our car with our little tiny travel trailer behind it and, oh, and come around a curve. Oh, that looks familiar, doesn't it? We'd, we'd agree. And, and, you know, I think it's just just around the corner and I can just visualize that last curve where that beautiful campsite by the river is. Well, this went on for an hour and a half and by the time we were on a trackless piece of dirt and bumping rocks going about one miles an hour, we realized we better turn this thing around or we're, <laughs> we're in big trouble. And so it is that it's so easy, you know, I was so pleased that uh, Gandhav reinstituted his awards because it's so easy to trivialize our high aspirations. I've had a personal campaign, being a meditation teacher over the years, a personal campaign to, to remind us yogis that when we meditate, meditation is an act of devotion, an act of seeking union. Now I promised my other speakers I wouldn't talk about either of those two subjects, so I just let you know that. Um, <laughs> Because, you know, we get into our routine, and let's face it, it's difficult for people learning to meditate to even get the routine. Some years ago in Seattle, we created a little CD of three different guided meditations to help students take what we do in the class home with them and begin to get it. But it's not easy to get the routine down. Well, there you are. You put in all that effort. You get your routine down, and pretty soon you're just huffing and puffing your way through the routine. And thinking, okay, a third stage of meditation, let's see, that's expansion, that's silence, right? Stillness, yeah. Okay, so I got to do this, and I got to huff and a puff, and I'll, you know, this, that hung and a saw, and all the, way, all the way through to the end. Now I'm silent. Yeah, I think I'm pretty silent. I'm going to try to be silent, but I only have a few minutes to be silent. But he's all, I got to go. <laughs> I mean, what's the one complaint, the one complaint greater than any that we all have, that our meditation students Tell us, it's between the ears. It's the restless mind. Swamiji has, I think in the book, Awakened to Superconsciousness, I think also in the Art and Science of Raja Yoga, and many times has commented on something interesting, fairly obvious once you see it, like other things that we finally see. And it's related to the simple fact that the word yoga describes both the process, you might say the techniques of life force control, pranayama, and withdrawal, and so on, and the goal. And so it is, he says, I'm not sure I could paraphrase it as eloquently as he, but he says that if we seek rest as a consequence of doing, we will never be satisfied by the rest that comes. Because, as I think Davy was speaking about yesterday, it's just, uh, it's, it's maya, it's, it's, it's duality. We'll huff and puff our way through the day and hope to get rest at night and read a book perhaps, or God forbid, watch television, which, which I certainly don't do. I know many of you don't do, but many people on this planet do. And 
it just the cycle goes on and on. Instead, rather, if in our consciousness, through the practice of pranayama, of yoga, of meditation, etc., if we act and move from our center, we take that center of rest into activity and action, as Krishna says, become inaction and inaction, action. And thus the boundary line between what we seek to do in meditation and the act of meditation and the activities of the day, which after all, we spend a lot more hours of the day in activity than we do in meditation. At least I do, maybe you don't. But in any case, we begin to, to dissolve that boundary line. Yesterday, um, Jyotish mentioned the first four stanzas of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. And now we come to the practice of yoga. Atta yoga anashasanam, or something like that. And of course, the most famous of all, yoga chitta vritti nirod. Well, that process, if we lose sight of that goal, and it's so easy to lose sight of that goal, then we simply don't achieve it. So what I'd like to talk about just for a few minutes is how to find that throughout the practice of meditation, not to fall back in the trap that it's out there somewhere. It's at the end of my meditation. It's at the end of X thousands of Kriyas, for example, or at the end of years of meditation, I'll be like Swamiji. I'll be like this person or that person. That, of course, is our delusion. You know, it's a little bit like climbing a mountain. You, uh, at least I'm told, I've done a little bit of climbing, but nothing technical. And in any case, what I've read about, say, climbing Mount Everest, is you, you, one of the things you need to do is you climb to a certain altitude, you acclimate there for a period of time, day two, three, then go back down to your base camp or your lower and uh, reoxygenate and so on and so forth. I once uh, climbed to 15,300 feet in Nepal, the Gosai Kund Pass, and uh, at least there I experienced what, what one reads about, which is that intense headache that you get from oxygen deprivation and didn't sleep a wink, which was the other thing I was told to expect throughout the night until we finally came down the other side of the pass to more oxygen-rich levels. But when we meditate, it's a little bit like that. We, we aspire to superconsciousness. We aspire to perfect stillness. We aspire to the presence of God through the guru or through light and so on, the eight aspects of God. We have a taste of this, and then we come down. The delusion we commonly face reminds me of something my friend Prem Shanti here today uh, sometimes tells her husband Larry. She said she's learned to acquire the fine art of diplomacy in this respect. When he comes out of seclusion or a meditation with some hair, yet another harebrained idea. And <laughs> bear in mind, I do this all the time, so I don't mind telling the story. Um, she says, Larry, some of your ideas are better than others. And I can't tell you how many harebrained ideas I've come out of a seclusion with and only to have Padma politely redirect them to something more practical. One time I came out of what I thought was a pretty good seclusion and came home and the first thing I came across, I was checking my emails, of course, and first thing I came across was this scathing letter to the community residents from one of our residents who wasn't really involved with us at all just denouncing the leadership here at, at our community um, for being schmucks, one thing or another. I don't remember what the issue was. Well, I was empowered with, you know, this great seclusion. I wrote him a letter or two. <laughs> Worst thing I could have done, right? But I felt the power, <laughs> the inspiration. It was way off. I always loved it. It's advice Swamiji has given, but of course, anybody who's done it would give the same advice, and I, I do too, though I don't heed it as often as I'd like. You know, it's fine to write the letter. Just don't send it. <laughs> it's really simple. Just don't send it. It's fun to write letters like that. But In any case, what I'm saying is in this process, just like you know, ignoring that map, looking for that campsite, we need to listen. We need to use our common sense. 
you know, in the Bhagavad Gita, and rather in the Mahabharata, of which the Bhagavad Gita is but a chapter, in the great story of the, of the war of Kurukshetra, uh, the eldest son of the good guys, the Pandavas, Yudhisthira, represents calmness aligned with the throat chakra. And I think most of you here know the story, but in any case, he gambles away his kingdom, just as we gamble away our kingdom of inner peace by our entanglement with desire and delusions. And that's, that's something we need to watch out for on the path of meditation, because we do have these experiences. We do have these inspirations, but we need to be careful. I, uh, I don't know how many of you know A Midsummer's Night Dream, Shakespeare's play, but remember the scene, a uh, charming scene, Ti Queen Titania is uh, mad at her husband. I don't know if he was flirting or something. He may have been, but anyway, so he falls asleep and she puts some pixie dust on him. Remember that? And then she has dresses somebody up in a, in a head of a, a, a donkey. And uh, so that with this pixie dust, the first thing he does, he's going to fall in love with his, the first thing he sees when he wakes up. Well, this is a, a very interesting symbol for what happens when we have these inspirations. You know, someone comes to me and they say, I think Master is guiding me this way. I know right away I'm on red alert, right? Because what that really means is I've put up my shields, or the enterprise, because that means you can't tell me anything against that inspiration. So be careful of that. I've always admired, deeply respected the fact that Swamiji, who has every right to... Uh, you know, share inspirations and ideas, meeting after meeting, community meeting, or little groups and this, that, and the other over the years. So often he'd introduce a new idea, what I have to confess to all too often seemed pretty crazy to me. In any case, a new idea, an inspiration, very with, with sweet reason, as he puts it, an openness to people's input and so on. Over time, and I have to say it took me more time than it probably should have, but over time, I gathered increasing respect for those inspirations. He didn't cloak those ideas with the power of his superconscious, master-guided inspirations. And so we too, we forget that the state of superconsciousness is has as you might say its foundation, humility, self-offering, the renunciation, the self-sacrifice, for example, that Nirmala talked about in my little campaign to help yogis remember to, to go into meditation as an act of devotion, one of the little secrets I've discovered for myself is to, you know, there you are, you, you only have so much time, right? And you're going to do your pranayama, you're going to do some chanting, you're going to, you know, do the hong sa, or maybe om, kriya, etc., etc. And so you've got this long laundry list of things to do. Well, just stop. Take that deep breath. You know, in group meditations, we always do a prayer, but it's so easy to not be mindful. Just take that moment when you sit. Look into the eyes of the Master. We bring, Jyotish yesterday used the visualization of light. You know, our path, the path of self-realization, Kriya and Raja and so forth, has for its central practice, pranayama, life force, withdrawal, control, and self-offering. Yes. And, and yet it's interesting, isn't it? At least I find it so that Master gave a whole book, Metaphysical Meditations, and Swamiji recorded this beautiful um, set of 13 recordings of some of those with a background of, of quite beautiful music, Herbert Holtz, the music of the planets and so forth. And he himself in the book Awakened to Superconsciousness has given in, at the end of every chapter these guided visualizations. But I know that many of us, as Kriyabans and so forth, um, don't necessarily draw upon visualization. And I think, even if we don't do a formal, long-guided one necessarily, but I think we make a mistake in that. We can sit and even just visualize our own self sitting there in meditation as if from a distance. Visualize ourself entering that light, merging with the Master, whatever you know, might inspire you. The power of nature to inspire us, for example, the strength of trees, the majesty of mountains, isn't an anthropomorphism. It's because that strength and majesty created those trees and mountains. Our instinct to draw upon these images for strength, the calmness 
of the moon, for example, the power of the sun, is rightly guided. Just take a moment to draw that image, whether it be the guru or some other image of in, or a more impersonal image of the eight at one of the eight aspects and so forth. Take that moment and make that your istadevata, your image of divinity. And commit, as it were, visualize and intend to find union with that divinity in that meditation to touch. I tell my meditation students, you know, We'll tell you technically that you're supposed to uh, be in silence for, oh, I don't know, a quarter or so or th up to a third of your meditation. But I'm going to tell you something that's not in the book. Because particularly as a beginning meditator, if you go by the clock and you're sitting there, yeah, I'm in silence, as I said earlier, you're not going to get anywhere. I would rather you have a nanosecond, a moment of perfect stillness that opens the heart and expands your sense of space, your sense of self for a moment, and I know you'll come back to meditate that evening. It's as simple as that. We have to go up to that rarefied atmosphere where no oxygen is needed in breathlessness, and then return to daily life. But don't pollute daily life by imagining that the desires of, and restlessness of daily life are somehow inspired. Instead, bring that peace, sitting at a stoplight, pause. In, in the book, uh, Do It Now, which has been converted to Do It Well, there's a whole series of daily counsels that Swamiji gives about feeling the space between people's words, the space between activities. You know, the energization exercises, tense with will, relax and feel, have for I mean, many ways by which you can plunder, as it were, their wisdom. But one of those is the simple fact that there's a natural cycle of prana, of energy and intelligence through our bodies that manifests in the breath and night and day, the need for sleep and rest. I counsel students that during the day, if you observe your activities, let's say you're an office worker and you pick up a task, you pick up the phone, make a phone call, you'll notice that you'll go through a very natural cycle by which you put out energy, and then you withdraw. Maybe it's a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, or maybe you glance out the window and pause. Uh, it, we just do this naturally. I remember Swamiji's advice at one of my first eight-hour meditations at Christmas time. Somebody tell me when to stop talking. I lost track. I'll stop talking soon. Um, I remember at one, of, one of the things that he said is follow the natural rhythm of prana. In a long meditation especially, you know, uh, you're going to encounter maybe some sleepiness, you're going to be focused and inspired, and then that's going to wane a little bit. F ride those waves like a surfer. It, I have found, for example, it came from years, of, I don't particularly struggle with sleepiness myself, but in a longer meditation, you're bound to have some of it. And I realized after some time that sleepiness is a mood, merely. Like a little wave coming into the beach, it sort of rises and swells, come up to the beach, spreads and then withdraws. I have found that I cannot, cannot fall asleep if I, no matter what else that my body does, if I hold my attention at the point between the eyebrows calmly, not resisting the sleep, not getting anxious about the fact that I'm getting sleepy and might fall over and embarrass myself, any of those kinds of, you know, uh, hong snore techniques that people do, <laughs> but just hold it right there with perfect trust, perfect faith. You cannot fall asleep. In fact, I discovered this um, in a different way um, in dealing with uh, tr trying, wanting to fall asleep at night. And so I, and I'm sure some of you have done some hong saw lying down and so on. At first I thought, oh my goodness, if I do this, will I pollute my hong saw practice and create a, a, a habit of sleeping during hong? Well, it, I didn't. I, I don't think it's necessarily so. But what I found is I'd gaze into the spiritual eye, I'd practice Hong Sa in order to be calm and go to sleep. But I, boing, you know, I just, <laughs> wow, it's bliss. You know, you just sort of slip into that quiescent, very quiet heart breath state. And it was wonderful. And then I'd realize, you know, it's two o'clock and I got to get up at six. And <laughs> so you discover it either way. But following that natural rhythm, you know, even when you do a yoga posture, you stand perhaps in Tadasana, the standing pose, you draw your energy in, perhaps with the breath you come up, 
take that subconscious energy, that physical energy locked into the subconsciousness of the body. You draw that energy up, hold it there, consciously offering that energy, and exhale, not back into subconsciousness, but into the causal, into bliss, into stillness. Each of our techniques, for example, (gasps) the double breath, hold the breath out, cleanse and clear the mind. And feel the mind sparkle, the thinking mind transit into the spacious mind. As long as we're thinking, like I was doing on that camping, oh yeah, look at that, that looks familiar. We're not meditating. When motion ceases, God begins.